while the Newberry is still closed and we're all social distancing, we wanted to keep you connected with our collections. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about Daniel Defoe's 1722 novel, A Journal of the Plague Year, and more specifically, um, one of Defoe's printed sources for the novel, The Bills of Mortality. Much has been written in recent months about Defoe's novel, which is a fictionalized account of the 1665 plague outbreak in London that killed about 100,000 people, or around 15% of London's population at the time. And while Robinson Crusoe published um, three years earlier in 1719, is far and away Defoe's best known novel, I have a sneaking suspicion that in the coming months and years, a lot of people are going to be reading, talking about, and teaching Journal of the Plague Year. So especially if you're a student, sorry, but get ready to read this novel, which is great. You should read it. So what was a 1665 London plague? Uh, there are a few different types of plague, but the one that was most prevalent in 1665 was the bubonic plague, which is probably familiar to many of us. Caused by black rat fleas, um, the plague had a few different symptoms, including headaches and vomiting, but most notably swelling of the lymph nodes, and the swellings were called bubos, or uh, Defoe calls them tokens in the book. About 30% of people infected died within two weeks, so it was a really deadly disease. Um, once the first death by plague was reported in 1665, those with the means and the money to do so left London. They went to the country or as far away as they could get. Um, this group included the king who went to Oxford, as well as wealthy merchants and even doctors, which is a little disturbing, I have to say. People who were infected with the plague were not allowed to leave and were locked in their house. So even if someone in their family had the plague, they were locked up. A cross was painted on the door and men called watchmen were stationed in the streets to prevent people from leaving. Defoe writes a little bit about the ways in which people try to escape or evade the watchmen. At times this included killing the watchmen. So you have an idea of how tense it was and how desperate people were to escape. Defoe's narrator is a merchant who um, stays in London for various reasons, and at first he's at home, self-quarantining, baking bread, brewing beer, doing all things that seem very familiar to those of us who have been at home for several months. Um, but eventually he decides that he's going to wander the streets of London and record at Sights and Sounds. And it's quite a jarring read at this moment. Everything is so familiar that it feels less like a 300-year-old novel and more like reading the New York Times, I have to say. Now, Defoe was born in 1660, so he was just a child during the plague outbreak. Um, and therefore, he had to rely on anecdotes and printed sources when writing his novel in the 1720s. We think he may have used not, uh, stories from his uncle Henry Foe, so the de was added to the family name later. And in fact, the narrator of the novel identifies himself as H.F. There were a number of people who kept diaries during the plague, including Samuel Pepys, the handsome man we see here, the most famous diarist of the period. Um, in an entry dated October 1665, Pepys writes, So many poor, sick people on the streets, and so many sad stories overheard as I walk, but there are great hopes of a decrease this week. I was curious about Pepys's comment about a decrease in plague deaths, because Defoe's narrator is also interested in charting deaths across London. On the bottom of this page of the novel, we see a list or a partial list of the deaths in various parishes at the end of July. Um, so I was curious about how Londoners got news of the plague in 1665 and how they tracked deaths across London and in their own area and how they knew when it was safe to go out. In part, they got their information through these printed broadsides, one of which we see here, called the Bills of Mortality. Published every Thursday, the bills contained a list of the number of people who had died in the previous week and how and where they died. Deaths were recorded within each parish. So these were not like obituaries. Nobody's name appears here. We have no information about them other than how they died and where they died. While the bills were intended to help officials track disease, they were made available to the public and they were hugely popular. So you could either subscribe to the bills of mortality or you could buy them singly on the street from news peddlers called Mercury Women. 
Um, and they function like a prototype newspaper. So I want to emphasize that at this time in London, they did not have anything like our modern newspapers. So I think that the bills of mortality were really instrumental in shaping the way that people thought about the news and consumed the news. The bills of mortality date back to the late 16th century in England um, and were printed throughout the 17th century. The, collect the title page of the collection that we see here um, is from a, it's a collection that was published, um, reprinted at the end of 1665. The Newbery actually owns this item, but um, our copy is not digitized. This is not an image of our item. Our copy is not digitized, and I can't get into the library right now. So this, I was able to get this image from Ebo, which is Early English Books Online, and the Ebo copy is from Cambridge. Um, so the bills were compiled by parish clerks. How did the clerks get their information? They used data recorded by people called searchers, and searchers were people with little to no medical training, and they were often women, whose job it was to examine dead bodies and record what they thought the cause of death was. Um, so because they had little or no medical training and were not doing autopsies per se, they were just looking at the bodies and trying to figure out how the people died. So it's already a really imperfect science. On top of that, people would often bribe or beg searchers to record plague deaths as something else because it really, you did not want a plague death recorded in your house or your parish. It really limited your movement. Um, and so plague deaths were actually underreported or underrecorded in the period. And about 65,000 plague deaths were reported, and we think it was actually about 100,000 plague deaths. Um, searchers recorded their information, sometimes in a notebook. They often just had to record it to memory um, and give their report orally to the parish clerk. So again, there's a lot of room for misinformation um, there. Once searchers turned the reports over to the parish clerks, the clerks compiled the information in parish registers, or at least kept the tally of deaths, that they then reported to the central hall to be compiled into the bills of mortality. The clerks had the responsibility and the privilege or the right to print and sell the bills. Um, they had had them printed all throughout the 17th century, but by 1625, when there was another plague outbreak in London, the clerks had a printing press installed in their central hall so they could print the bills in-house, so to speak. They didn't have to go to a middleman. As a printing historian, it's a really fascinating moment to think about how the clerks were compiling the information, then turning around repackaging it and selling it back to the public. So there's a lot of information going on uh, on the bill, so let's break it down a little bit. Um, on the left-hand side, we have the causes of death from the previous week. So we see by the red arrow that there's one plague death, um, which is good or not bad. Uh, and it's fascinating to look at the other causes of death, I think. And there are a lot that seem familiar to us, like consumption or rickets or scurvy. And a lot of them, though, that seem really foreign to us. Uh, my favorite is always rising of the lights, which seems like maybe a really gentle way and romantic way to die with soft music and cherubs lifting you heavenward. In reality, though, it was asthma or some kind of lung problem that involved coughing, and I'm sure it was not at all pleasant. At the bottom of the page, we see the total deaths for the week, um, broken down by males and females. We have a separate category for plague deaths, decrease in burials, parishes clear of the plague and parishes infected, and then finally the price of a, of a loaf of bread. So the bills function as kind of a price index as well for people, so another type of news um, along with the plague. Um, and I'd like to talk about the numbers for a minute. And right now, we always we have a bunch of different numbers that we look at for COVID-19. So we look at daily numbers and weekly numbers, but we also have a running total of deaths for our area. Um, and in 1665, though, they did not keep a running total of deaths, so they did not. You could not see a total of people who had been killed by the plague. Um, instead, they. Um, they only looked at weekly numbers. So uh, 
the bills of mortality really worked, I think, to structure how people thought about the plague and news of the plague, and they thought about it in a periodic unit of one week. So when Pepys writes in his diary that he hopes to see a decrease in deaths this week, he's talking about a decrease on the bill of mortality for that week. Um, and the weekly numbers in 1665 were used in kind of a similar way to we, the way that we use our COVID-19 numbers today. People could only move about once their house or their parish was no longer infected. And in general, they had what we might call kind of a phase reopening, although not really. So for example, playhouses could only be open if there were less than 30 plague deaths a week. Um, so they, they did use the numbers to try to determine what people could do and how they could move about. On the other side of the page, we see the deaths broken down by parish, so by area. And again, we have a, a column for regular deaths and then a separate column for plague deaths. And this was a way that people could chart the movement of the plague. So the plague actually moved east across London and started west and moved east. And so here it was a way of determining what we would call hot spots, for example. By June of that year, we see the plague deaths up to 112 a week. I will say rising of the lights is holding steady at 12 deaths. Um, and by August, the end of August, the plague deaths um, are sadly at 2,010 deaths for the week um, and with an increase of 229 deaths. Um, and the plague continued throughout the fall. Um, so there's a lot to be read into the bills of mortality and in the way that Defoe uses them to create his narrative. I think the bills of mortality were important because they gave people news they could use, but also they could hold on to physically in their hands. And it helped people to critically analyze the frightening crisis in which they were living, but it also instilled or inculcated in them a sort of news consciousness and a desire for news that was published periodically. And I think it's no coincidence that the first group of people to write and publish periodicals in the 18th century, like Daniel Defoe and Richard Steele and Joseph Addison, who were born a little bit after Defoe, um, they all came out of what I might call this post-plague generation and its moment of burgeoning news consciousness. So Journal of the Plague Year does read like a journalistic account of the of the plague outbreak in 1665. Um, and while he weaves narratives out of the data found on the bills of mortality in the book, I think he also uses the bills um, and other types of news sources as a visual cue for his readers. And it's a cue that lends a veracity and authenticity to the novel for people who by 1722 were very accustomed to reading news in a certain format, in a printed format, and it's a little bit lost on, on I think people who are less familiar, like the modern reader who's less familiar with that kind of news format. So um, learning about the bills of morta mortality and thinking about them has given me a lot to think about, just not only about Defoe and the historical novel, but about how we are using news today and are using the news to write narratives about the pandemic through which we're currently living. So I have really enjoyed thinking about them and rereading the novel, and I hope that you will reread it too. Um, thanks so much for watching and listening to me today and for being part of our community of learning here at the Newberry. If you have questions, please share them with us below or in a DM and we will get back to you right away. Um, and please visit www.newberry.org to continue exploring our collections at a distance. I hope to see you back at the Newberry soon or if not in person, then definitely online. So thanks again for listening today.